Okay. Um, well, first I want to uh, thank the uh, program committee for the invitation to, uh, to speak at this uh, conference. It's really an honor. Um, I want to... Uh, uh, I want to uh, begin also by uh, acknowledging uh, all the work that uh, my, my group has done. And in particular, Anna and Mariona, who have done all the work that I'll be talking about uh, today. Um, this work was also done in collaboration with uh, Jeff Kimball at Caltech. Um, so to provide a bit of motivation, um, there's probably a, a, uh, quite a, a few people in this room whose goal is to somehow achieve strong and controlled interactions between single atoms and single photons. Um, so that's a potential resource for a lot of applications, uh, most directly for quantum information processing or for single photon level nonlinear optics. Um, if you can really kind of control atom-photon interactions, you can also use that as a building block to build up more complex states. For example, states that might be useful for metrology or even explore many body physics. Um, the problem is that this goal is hard, and you can kind of quantify that. Um, so in particular, if you imagine trapping a single atom and focusing uh, a laser beam onto the atom with some area A, um, if the laser beam is resonant with the atomic transition, then you can ask, you know, what's the probability that a photon in this beam will scatter off that single atom? Um, so that scattering probability you can understand in terms of effective uh, scattering cross-section of the atom. That's actually nothing more than the resonant wavelength of the transition uh, squared. So it doesn't really depend on the microscopic details of the atom. Um, so the scattering probability is lambda squared divided by A. And the reason that um, achieving uh, controlled interactions is hard is because in free space you have to obey the diffraction limit. So it's very hard to focus a beam down to lambda squared. Um, there's groups that actually try to do this experiment. I think the record so far for uh, interaction probability is something around 20%. Um, so there are some uh, you know, pretty well-known fixes in the community. Uh, one is cavity QED. In that case, you put the atom between two very good mirrors. So then the photon doesn't just pass the atom a, sing a single time, it uh, hits the atom over and over again. In that case, the interaction is uh, basically that of a, a single photon on a single pass times the number of bounces that the photon makes. So this number can be bigger than one, which means you can't directly interpret it as a probability anymore. Um, but this uh, figure of merit, which is the so-called cooperativity factor in QED, is uh, still a very important uh, uh, figure of merit to describe how good your system is. Um, the other kind of general strategy is to use many atoms. In that case, the interaction is enhanced by the atom number, and that's known as the optical depth of your atomic medium. Um, so these parameters of cooperativity and optical depth, they're really uh, widely viewed as a kind of fundamental limit uh, to the errors uh, that you incur um, for any kind of application uh, that you try involving atom light interfaces. Um, so there's kind of hundreds of examples uh, that you can find in literature, but just to highlight a couple. Um, here's a kind of review paper on just th things you can do generally with atoms, uh, atomic ensembles, and light. And in the in introduction, uh, just to highlight one sentence, they say that you know, the requirement that the optical depth is much larger than one is the most significant requirement for all types of uh, the quantum interface between atomic ensembles and light known up to now. Um, just to give a little bit more concrete example, um, this is a really beautiful paper from Alexei Gorshkov uh, and Misha Lukin, where they analyzed the error of a quantum memory. So a quantum memory is um, an atomic gas where you, you send in a, a single photon, and you would like to uh, control it and reversibly convert that photon into a collective atomic excitation and then retrieve it later. So there's a lot of different protocols uh, that you can use to implement a quantum memory. And one of the beautiful conclusions of this paper was um, you know, whatever approach you take, at least theoretically, if you optimize it in your experiment, it should yield the identical maximum efficiency, which only depends on the optical depth of the medium. And one of the kind of technological bottlenecks is for most of the things you want to do, um, the errors actually decrease very slowly as a function of cooperativity or optical depth. So for example, in the case of a quantum memory, the error is known to scale as about six divided by the optical depth. Um, so now I'd like to kind of dig a little bit deeper and, and ask, is that really the full story? So if we take this kind of optical depth of an atomic ensemble, we can kind of ask more abstractly, where did this kind of linear scaling in number of atoms come, come from? So it sounds kind of intuitive that it's just scale like n, but there is one assumption, an important assumption in there, 
which is that atoms are interacting with light independently. It's like a photon comes in, it tries to interact with the first atom. If the first atom fails, then the second one has a chance to succeed. And then the third one, and so on. Uh, so then the effectiveness is just multiplied by the number of attempts or the number of atoms you have. Um, but that can't be true, okay? Because um, when you send in a photon and it scatters off atoms, that's a wave phenomenon. If you want to understand the scattering probability into 4 pi, you basically have to understand the intensity uh, pattern that's radiated. And the intensity pattern has to have wave interference built in between the different radiating atoms, or correlations, if you want, in the quantum regime, in the quantum domain. Um, so you can dig a little bit deeper and ask, well, where did wave interference get thrown out exactly in, in quantum optics or atom-light interactions? Basically, it turns out it got thrown out already in equation one. So the first equation you write down to model these systems doesn't have wave interference built in. So to give a kind of concrete example for that, if you take the James Cummings model, so atoms in a cavity, um, if you take multiple atoms instead of one, um, then you tend, almost everyone writes down this kind of uh, starting model. So there's the gen, usual coherent James Cummings term, that's fine. But the issue is when you add in the losses. Um, so when you add in the losses, basically everyone puts in by hand that if an atom is excited, it's gonna emit at a fixed rate gamma out of the cavity into four pi, and it doesn't matter what any of the other atoms are doing. So there's no interference in that story. Um, similarly, when you write down the Maxwell block equations for atomic ensembles, um, you usually write it down as a kind of quasi one-dimensional problem. So you assume there's a kind of quasi one-dimensional beam like a Gaussian, which interacts with the atoms. So you write down a wave equation where your atomic polarization density acts as a source. Um, so one thing is, uh, in practice, almost everyone takes this uh, atomic polarization density as a smooth object, so the granularity of atoms isn't built in. But of course, if you want to describe interference, that should, descri that should depend on exactly where your atoms are. So interference is already thrown out at this point if you smooth over the atomic density. And just to make uh, matters worse, if you write down the, the block equation, um, so if you have some atomic coherence, again, you put in by hand that that atomic coherence decays independently, independent of what any other atoms are doing. Um, so I'd like to kind of uh, give at least a partial answer to two questions. Um, if we want to try to include weight of interference into the story, what should equation one be? And hopefully it should be a kind of tractable equation as well. Um, the second thing is once you build interference properly into the story, can you do something more powerful with it? Can you design new protocols with better error bounds than, than what people knew? And can you maybe see novel phenomena that you couldn't even predict from, from fundamental principles by conventional theories such as the Maxwell block equations. Um, so I have to introduce one kind of mathematical object, which is the electromagnetic Green's function. Um, so the electromagnetic Green's function is basically the, um, the answer to this question. If I have a classical oscillating dipole uh, at some frequency omega and at point r prime, what's the total electric field seen at a point r? Um, so that's the formal definition. Um, I think everyone in this room knows an example of a, of a Green's function, even if you don't call it that. So in free space, it's just the famous you know, dipole lobe radiation pattern. Okay? Um, the point is, you know, the Green's function, uh, you can define in, in free space, but you can also def uh, define uh, in the presence of more complex structures. So for example, you can have a classical oscillating dipole. You can have some dielectric object nearby. In that case, the total field at R is not just the kind of free low pattern, but it contains a kind of scattered, rescattered component off the dielectric as well. Um, and in any case, you know, it, well, in some cases, you can calculate uh, the total Green's function um, analytically, or at worst, you can calculate it numerically. Okay. Um, so if we were talking about atoms and light, um, a priori, there's a huge number of degrees of freedom. I have many atoms, potentially, and I also have a continuum of electromagnetic field modes. Um, so one trick in kind of getting to a, a new equation one is to realize that the field is not an independent degree of freedom. You can actually integrate it out. Um, so let me give a kind of classical analogy to that. So imagine I have some kind of classical scatters, like polarizable point dipoles. I send in a, a field, an incident field, which I presume I know. That's kind of fair. That could be a Gaussian beam, for example. And I want to know what's the total field at some detection point out here. So formally, I can always write that the total field is an incident field, what I send in plus the field scattered by these dipoles. Okay. Um, it turns out that works as an operator equation as well. So the total quantum electric field operator is the uh, uh, incident or, or kind of homogeneous solution 
plus the rescatter component. So now I've already generalized or uh, specified to atoms. So my atomic dipole moment is nothing more than atomic coherence between the ground and excited states. And then um, the field at this point uh, out here is the kind of atomic dipole times the Green's function, which propagates the field from the atomic location, Ri, out to my detection point. And the reason that this works as a kind of quantum equation is that you know, both classical and quantum fields obey Maxwell's equations. Okay, so the solutions should look the same. Um, so the important thing about this equation is it looks a little bit like a kind of input-output equation. For example, what it says is if I want to calculate the total field somewhere, any correlation function involving the total field, in principle, I can calculate just from correlation functions involving the atoms alone. So the field is really encoded in the atomic properties. Um, the only issue so far is I don't know a priori what the atoms themselves are doing. I don't know the atomic correlation functions yet, so I need a way to solve for that. Um, so you can imagine kind of abstractly, I can write down the Heisenberg equations of motion for the atoms. The atoms, of course, will be driven by the field. But I argued on the previous slide that the field I can just rewrite in terms of all the other atoms. So the effective equations of motion for the atoms can be derived from an effective Hamiltonian effective, you know, quote, spin Hamiltonian, involving only the atomic degrees of freedom. Um, so maybe this Hamiltonian looks a little bit abstract, but um, if you dig in, you see it kind of makes intuitive sense. So the type of the spin interaction basically says that one atom, which is up in an excited state, can drop down to the ground state, and another atom, which is in the ground state, can jump up to the excited state. So that kind of makes sense. That's what photon-mediated uh, emission and reabsorption should do. And then the strength of that process is just given by the Green's function, which describes how a field propagates between atom I and atom J. Okay, so this Hamiltonian kind of makes intuitive sense. Um, it's actually a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, so it describes, uh, and it's true because uh, this Green's function is actually a complex number. Um, so it describes really both coherent interactions, in other words, this kind of real spin exchange, but it also encodes collective spontaneous emission, or the kind of interference of energy as it's radiated into 4 pi. Um, so of course, if I have a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, it's not a complete description of an open quantum system. I'd have to either tell you the quantum jump operators associated with this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, or write down a full master equation for the density matrix. So when we do our calculations, we do all of that. I'm just not going to write down uh, the kind of full equations here, because it's not such an important part of uh, getting understanding of the physics. Um, so here we are. This is what I'd like to propose as a different alternative equation one for atom light interactions. Um, I should say, well, uh, the, I mean, there's nothing here that's uh, particularly new. So these equations are some variation of them. They've appeared in, in many contexts uh, over you know, several decades. And you know, more recently, in the past few years, uh, a growing number of, of people, of theorists, have looked at you know, quantum optics and dense uh, gases or atomic arrays. Uh, mostly at the single excitation or, or single photon level. Um, so now, I, you know, in, uh, going forward, I'd just like to kind of offer my own take on, you know, if we really take this seriously as equation one, how far can we go with it? And we can, can we get new insights into light matter interactions by approaching it as a quantum spin model? Um, to realize that this kind of equation, the set of equations is quite unique, um, you might notice that I haven't really just told you what system I'm looking at yet. So it turns out, you know, this kind of uh, equation one actually captures equally any system of atoms interacting with light. It could be atoms in a cavity, uh, uh, atoms interacting with light in free space, or atoms interacting with light in some complex nanophotonic structure. The only thing that's different as you jump from system to system is you have to plug in the appropriate Green's function, or at least a toy model of it, that's appropriate for that system. Um, so now let me take that kind of general formalism and consider a concrete system. So uh, to, to keep it simple, let's consider a 1D array of atoms. So there's some lattice constant D. Um, so the uh, array is along the z-axis. Um, so it's a 1D line of atoms, but it's interacting in, with photons in three-dimensional space. Okay? Um, so one kind of conceptually simple limit is to go to an infinite chain. In that case, because of the periodicity, we know the single excitation eigenstates of this effective Hamiltonian have to be in the form of block waves. Okay? So there's a kind of block wave vector k, and then the eigenstate associated with this uh, block state is um, atom j is excited, while all the other atoms are in the ground state, with some relative phase e to the i k z. 
And because I have a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, the energy uh, of this block mode is generally going to be complex. Um, so the next thing I can do is try to solve for the band structure. Um, so here's just a kind of empty band diagram. Um, what I'm plotting here is um, just going to be the real part of the energy, um, of this block energy, versus the block wave vector. And of course, the block wave vector is uniquely defined within the first Brillouin zone, which goes out to pi divided by the lattice constant. Um, so of course, you can always solve this thing numerically, but you can actually argue on pretty general grounds what the band structure, uh, what the main features of the band structure should look like. So in particular, I have an atomic resonance frequency. Uh, this is going to be optical transition, so several hundreds of terahertz. But we know atoms have very narrow line widths, okay? so typically spontaneous emission rates of a few megahertz or smaller. So it's only within that bandwidth that atoms, really only that atoms can talk to light. So regardless of the exact shape of the band structure, we know it's going to be very narrow on the order of the single atom emission rate in free space. So it's almost a flat band. Um, the next thing you can do is you can just draw in the uh, dispersion of light in empty space, omega equals CK. Um, the reason it's nice to do that is, um, well, so here I've only described the spin part of the solution, uh, the block mode. But of course, uh, because I have excited atoms, they're going to generate an electromagnetic wave. And the electromagnetic wave has to obey Bloch's theorem as well. So if I take a plane wave decomposition for the uh, fields emitted by uh, this spin state, um, I can generically write down that my total electric field in some kind of plane wave decomposition is a component along the uh, axis of the chain, e to the i kz, where this, block, this k vector is the same as the block wave vector. But my field lives in three-dimensional space, so there's going to be a transverse component, k perpendicular, as well. Um, by Maxwell's equations, I know that k squared plus k perpendicular squared has to equal omega over c squared. And so what you see is that this line, omega equals CK, actually separates two very different kinds of solutions. In particular, if K, if the block wave vector is already bigger than omega over C, so in other words, in this triangle here, or this triangle here, the only way I can satisfy this dispersion relation is if K perpendicular is imaginary. In other words, in this part of the uh, band diagram, these spin waves are only creating evanescent waves. They don't radiate energy out to infinity. So from that consideration, I can already tell you something about the imaginary part of this uh, block mode. Um, so in, this tri in these triangles, the decay rate will be zero. Okay, so these spin waves in particular, in principle, will live forever. But uh, within the light line, uh, the decay rate will be non-zero because these spin waves are emitting radiation fields. Um, so I think that's a kind of nice statement. Uh, basically, what you can conclude is um, this notion of subradiance. So you have a collective atomic excitation, but it never decays. In order to atomic rays, subradiance is just guided mode physics. This atomic chain is simply acting as a fancy optical fiber, or if you want a photonic crystal waveguide. Um, so if you want to ask what's the conditions for existence of these subradiant states or guided modes, um, well, you basically need that this dispersion relation of free space, omega equals CK, intersects the edge of the Brillouin zone above the bare atomic frequency. So you can convert that into distance. You basically need a, a lattice constant that's below lambda over 2. Um, so with that intuition, you can also go to a finite chain. So if an infinite chain is an optical fiber that guides light forever, a finite chain, you can kind of conclude, well, you can maybe have subradiant states, but the decay rate won't be exactly zero. It's like light is guided along the fiber, but then when it hits the fiber ends, uh, you'll get some kind of end fire emission, which leaks uh, radiation out to infinity. Um, so you can actually confirm all of that numerically. You can take, for example, 30 atoms. You can diagonalize the Hamiltonian, find the most uh, subradiant state. You find, in general, that the decay rate scales uh, with atom number, decreases with atom number, like the uh, third power. And then if you use this input-output equation to calculate the total fields, associated with a subradiant state, you really see it's like the end fire emission that you get from an optical fiber. Okay. Um, with that intuition uh, that you know, subradiant states are just optical fibers, um, you can also get some intuition of why subradiance is so hard to see. Okay, so subradiance, the word, is probably like 50 years old, but it's, it's kind of uh, exceedingly elusive to see in experiments. And from here, you can kind of get intuition why. So when you, see, when you say that you see atoms or you measure atoms, usually that means you're sending in some laser light. Okay? But laser light, no matter what direction you send it in, is by definition a radiation wave. So your laser always lives within the light line, 
but these exotic subradiant states always live outside. So there's a kind of fundamental impedance mismatch. Um, so once you realize that, um, you, know, you can try to uh, you know, find ways to get rid of this impedance mismatch and really talk to these subradiant states. A very natural way to do that is to use another set of guided modes, in particular a real nanophotonic interface. Um, so one example of a, a nanophotonic interface, which is pioneered by Arno Rauschenbeutel, is an optical nanofiber. So an optical nanofiber is basically a, a, a regular fiber, but you pull it so that um, the diameter becomes really thin, even smaller than the wavelength of light itself. And it turns out for a dielectric fiber, there's actually no cutoff. So even if, in theory, you can make the diameter arbitrarily small, there's still a guided mode. But to obey the diffraction limit, it turns out that a lot of that mode is guided on the outside of the fiber in the vacuum region. So here's a kind of numerical simulation of that. Here's a cross-section of the fiber, and a, a, this color scale shows the intensity of the guided mode. You indeed see that a lot of the intensity lives outside the fiber core and in the vacuum region. Um, so because the light uh, leaks significantly into the vacuum region, um, you can take far off resonant uh, light, send it in both directions into the fiber, and create a 1D optical lattice near the fiber surface, a couple hundred nanometers away. Um, once the atoms are trapped in that optical lattice, um, those same atoms also have a pretty efficient coupling to near-resonant guided photons of the fiber. And one way you can quantify that is if you just take a single atom and you bring it up to the excited state, um, it spontaneously emits into the guided modes at about 10% about of the time, as opposed to the free space emission. Okay. So now imagine that we can create a chain of atoms, a 1D lattice of atoms above the fiber, and the idea is that these previously subradiant states of the atomic chain can couple to the guided modes of the fiber. So here's a cartoon picture of uh, how that works, of how the impedance matching works. Uh, so the blue line was the dispersion of uh, the, just the atomic chain by itself. Um, the dispersion relation of the guided modes of the fiber um, will also live beyond the light line, almost by definition, because they're guided. And you can see that the fiber mode and the subradiant states of the atoms, they should intersect somewhere. Okay, so the fiber can now talk to these previously inaccessible states. If the fiber talks to that states, then I've actually kind of changed the concept on you a little bit. Of course, these states will not be subradiant anymore. So if I have this collective atomic excitation, it can leak into the fiber. But it turns out that's perfect. If your goal is to build an efficient atom light interface, that's exactly what you want. So these states are not subradiant anymore. We call them selectively radiant. And what that means is, you know, basically, if you want an efficient atom light interface, you want that you, you know, when atoms emit, you get that photon into your desired modes of interest 100% of the time. And that's what happens here. So these uh, atomic modes will always emit into the waveguide, but by impedance mismatch, they'll never be able to emit a photon or leak information into 4 pi. Okay. So you can use this concept of selective radiance to now try and go and beat these previous limits on optical depth. Um, so we analyzed one application in particular, which is a quantum memory for light. Um, so basically, um, one wants to ask the question, how well can you store an incoming photon wave packet as a collective uh, spin flip uh, to an atomic excited state? Um, so one example protocol is uh, EIT. So the idea is you have a lot of atoms in the ground state, you send in a, a photon wave packet. Um, this photon will, uh, you know, can be absorbed collectively by the atom. So an atom can go from the ground state up to the excited state. And then on top of that, uh, you shine in a big classical laser field. So you can transfer that excited state population, which is usually, usually short-lived, to uh, a metastable state S. Okay? So at the end of the process, you've coherently converted your incoming photon to a collective excitation in S. Um, so the Maxwell block equations or the previous analysis already shows, uh, establishes a bound on how well you can do that. So the error rate, so you, you try to store the photon but you realize you, you missed, that error rate goes like 5.8 divided by the optical depth. Um, on the other hand, we can try to include interference in the story. So we have a chain of atoms uh, coupled to the fiber. We put in the full Green's function for a fiber. And here's the new answer. So on the vertical axis is the error. Uh, versus as a function of the atom number. So this dotted line here is basically the max, old Maxwell block equations. And exploding selective radiance, we find that we can do exponentially better. Okay, so now the error rate is exponentially small in the optical depth. 
Um, to put in more concrete numbers, if you want to achieve a 1% error of a quantum memory, just you know, in principle, um, if you only have the max, if you believe in the Maxwell block equations, fundamentally you would need something like uh, around 10 million atoms, cold atoms in free space, or around 10,000 atoms coupled to an optical nanofiber. Uh, exploding subradiance, however, um, you can do the same with just 20 atoms coupled to the nanofiber. Um, I didn't explain this result, but it turns out you can actually avoid nanophotonics altogether. You can do this all in free space if you have a two-dimensional array. And then you can also achieve a 1% error in principle with 20 atoms. Um, so with that, I'm uh, uh, about done. Um, I'd like to just kind of raise a, a kind of interesting open question, which is what are the re new realm of possibilities if you exploit sub and selective radiance? In particular, you know, there's a lot of applications that have already been suggested for light matter interfaces. Um, you know, quantum memory, nonlinear optics, metrology, many body physics. So for the non-believers in wave interference, it's not that everything is known, but I think you know, we have a pretty good idea of what's possible and what's not uh, given practical resources. Um, but now, once you start exploiting sub and selective radiance, at least for a quantum memory, we know we can do exponentially better. And I think an interesting question going forward is, you know, what, what, does this, what, what does this kind of boundary look like uh, for all these other applications? Um, there's one reason that we looked at um, a quantum memory in particular uh, first. So a quantum memory, you're just trying to store a single excitation. Um, there's actually nothing quantum in anything I said. It's just classical linear optics, you know, the classical waveguide physics. Um, however, if you want to kind of start exploring the other directions, um, that really involves many photons. Um, in that case, you're really, you know, if you go back to the spin model, what you're really trying to solve generically is some interacting, driven, long-range, open, many-body spin system. So all those ingredients, you know, uh, people usually associate with being hard. So, you know, what you can kind of conclude from this is, you know, this spin model in general, you're not just going to roll out of bed and write down the answer. Um, to explore these other facets is a kind of, uh, you know, interesting and challenging theoretical problem going forward. Um, so with that, uh, thanks.